And today we're going to talk about Megan Fox and the interview that she did on Jimmy Kimmel where she says that she went to hell for all of eternity. And before we go any further, make sure that you subscribe to the channel, like or comment, anything to boost the algorithm to get it out to a lot of people because after this interview with Megan, we're going to compare her story with another man's story who said he also went to hell. But all of what he says is backed up in scripture with the experience that he had. And so... Just a little bit of viewing discretion advised because for younger people it might be a little too graphic, um, but just pay attention to that before we jump in. Here we go. <laughs> so we went to we went to Costa Rica to do ayahuasca like in a proper setting, like with indigenous people, and we were in the middle of the jungle. And I was thinking because the place we went, there's a lot of people like. I don't know if LeBron James has ever gone, but it's like a place where like, they're like, these kinds of people go here to do ayahuasca. So I was thinking it was like glamping or something like that. It's still gonna be like a, some kind of five-star experience. And you get there and you really are in the middle of the jungle and you don't get to eat after like 1 p.m. You have to walk a very far distance to get your water. You can't shower because they're in a drought. So you can't use the water, obviously. Like you need to respect the rainforest. Mm -hmm. um, nothing glamorous about it. It's all a part of sort of making you vulnerable so that you surrender to the experience. And the entire thing starts with something called vomitivo. I hope I'm allowed to divulge this, that it's okay that I share, but oh. I'm encouraging it. Um, so you go and we were with 20 other strangers and you all line up at like the, the edge of the rainforest over this weird fence and you go three by three and you drink lemongrass tea until you like by n not your own volition, just vomit everything out of your body. So you so start- So you have to vomit, there's no way around that part. You can't get out of it. And you have to vomit a certain amount before they let you get back with everybody. So you're like cheering on everyone as they like throw up. <laughs> and as like what we do, obviously, we were like, oh, I don't I know, I'm not, am I ready to just like throw up in front of all of these people? But it's such a good bonding experience. <laughs> and <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but but that gets you ready to then go into the ceremony that night because you're like, I my vanity is gone. I've just done this in front of all of these strangers, and like now I'm ready to like really open up. So we did it for three nights. It was incredibly intense. I went to everybody's journey is different. The second night, I went to to hell for eternity. Um, yeah, and to just knowing eternity is. Um, like t torture in itself because there was no beginning, middle, or end. So you have like a real ego death. Wait, wait, now, now how do you arrive and understand that that's what the moment is? Because is there a sign, next exit hell? <laughs> is it, I, yeah. I mean, it's, I, I was, it's your own psychological hell, basically, is the point of the medicine, right? This is a medicine that goes, it surpasses like anything you could do with talk therapy or like hypnotherapy or any of those things. It just goes straight into your soul and it takes you to the psychological prison that you hold yourself in. So it's, it's your own version of hell. And I was definitely there. So the first thing that I noticed after watching this interview with Megan is that the world is starving for supernatural spiritual experiences and they're not getting it in the church. And it's really breaking my heart because the churches are preaching this natural Jesus. They're not preaching a supernatural Jesus who did miracles and healed the sick and where he says the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power. Um, and so they're not getting this. And if they don't get it in the church from a Jesus who and a God who is real, who is still moving in the earth, if they're not getting it from him, then their only other option is to get it from the devil. And they're going to get it through the new age because the new age promises all of this stuff. They promise healing. They promise peace. They promise everything that, that Jesus and the Holy Spirit and relationship with God actually provides. They're getting a demonic form of it. And it might be good for a little while, but it's always perverted. And it always comes with depression, panic attacks, sickness in your body. It will always come with a price, whereas Jesus already paid the price. So the world is starving for this stuff. And I fortunately go to a church where we do walk in the supernatural and I'm, and praise the Lord, I'm hearing more and more of pastors who are stepping up to the plate, who are moving in power because, because the church needs it. The church themselves, um, Christians don't even know that this is available. And so they're starving as well. So praise the Lord. There are some churches out there. If you need to get plugged into a spirit filled, supernatural, uh, moving in the gifts church, 
then you can email my ministry at tracycoastinministries at gmail.com and I can try to help you um, find a church or maybe I'll link a few down um, in the description of this video. But the other thing that I noticed, um, I thought about was that when they start talking about hell and they go into that a little bit more, you hear everybody laughing in the background and they're laughing because the world does not take hell seriously. And when was the last time you even heard a pastor preach on hell seriously and the dangers of hell, that it's a real place, that people, when they die, if they don't know Jesus, they are going to hell. All of us are going to be standing before God, and it's called a great and terrible day. And it's called a great and terrible day when we stand before God and we're judged, because all of us will. But it's called that because for some, it's going to be great. We're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, and we will enter into eternity with Jesus forever. But for others, they will go to the lake of fire and spend eternity in torment. And so we've got to tell people this stuff. It is absolutely the loving thing to do to tell them. If we don't tell them, then they're going, I'd rather tell them and have them be mad at me on earth for a little while while they feel offended, but then eventually come to know Christ and get to, get to see me in eternity and thank me that I told them than for them to love me now because I didn't say anything that would ever offend them and I didn't tell them anything about hell and I told them, well, you're a good person so you'll probably be okay and then have them hate me in hell because I didn't tell them the truth. So now we're going to watch a video together of a man named Bill Wees who also claims to have gone to hell, but his description of hell is very different than Megan's description. And you're going to hear how his experience actually lines up with what the Bible describes hell to be like. So let's watch this together. Nothing unusual about the night. Um, I had never studied the topic, topic of hell at that point. I had never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before. We came home like any other normal night. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. I was walking to our kitchen. And right in about the living room, something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And I was getting hotter and hotter. And I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now. I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. A filthy, stinking, smoke-filled, but like a dungeon. But see, Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International, many other commentaries point out that Jonah was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. Well, that's why I first found myself. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could it be alive in this place? And uh, I, w I wanted to get up and run. That was my first reaction. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. It took so much effort to move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, a thousand times worse. Any movement takes tremendous effort. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, In Him we live and move and have our being. Movement isn't automatic. It's from God. I looked up in this cell and I saw these two enormous beasts, creatures, pacing like a vicious caged animal. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. It's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that too, but I got to keep moving. And... Um, they were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, uh, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long, and um, they were uh, pacing like the most vicious animal. And the one of them picked me up like I weighed the weight of a, like this bottle, threw me into the wall of this prison cell. I hit the wall. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. Now, a spirit maybe doesn't have bones, but it felt that way. I collapsed on the floor wondering, how could it be alive through this? 
But I have to explain one thing. I understood that I did not feel most of the pain. I had the understanding that it was being blocked. And I didn't understand, but on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain, but he did allow me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. But the amount I felt was enough. The other demon grabbed me, picked me up, and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. Again, how, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about in hell. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lip. He had a tongue. So you have some kind of a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But see, Leviticus 17, 11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They hate you. And, but see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive that benefit. And um, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see to describe to people what it looks like. But then he withdrew his light and hell resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could actually feel it. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Uh, it's so wicked and evil that the darkness just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. I was taken out of this prison cell and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across, like a huge hole in the ground, about a mile across, deep hole. I, I don't know how I knew it was a mile. I just understood that it was. I can't explain that, but there, this was filled with fire, flames raging high up into this open cavern. And, uh, you know, so it's not metaphorical fire like some say. It's real, literal flames. I felt the heat. I saw the fire. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms eleven six says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, the angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more verses about fire. But this is where I could first see people. I could see through the flames. And it's the most awful sight to see a person on fire. Most of us have never seen that. But to see someone burning. Now, I could not distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons. And it appeared to me like flesh hanging off their bones. I, it was the most horrible sight. And the screams coming from the people was so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. But Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not God's people. She don't ever get to enjoy quiet. You hear, hear these horrible screams forever. Uh, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. Uh, but I understood that's where I was at. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell or Hades is. I'll just give you two addresses. Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Very clear it's down deep in the earth. I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment Suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. 
any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. I wanted to uh, let my wife know where I was at. I just wanted to say goodbye. But I understood I'll never get that opportunity. See, Job 7.9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. Sheol, Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. Hades is a Greek word. But I had that understanding I'll never get out. And see, you don't know what that's... Well, you can't imagine what that's like to have no finality with your family. That you can't say goodbye. You, you can never tell them where you're at. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You cease to, you still exist down deep in the earth. And to never see her again, to not let her know where I'm at and say goodbye, that thought alone was really tormenting to endure that you have to endure for all eternity. I mean, you'll never see any of your family. You'll never hug your kids again. Nothing. That's gone. Thing of the past. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, because there's pleasure, right, in being with people. Even if you don't know them, it's pleasure to be with a person. But see, those people I saw in the pit, they're all kept at a distance. So you have no conversation. You're isolated. You're by yourself in hell for all eternity. You'll never have another conversation with anybody. And you have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26. All these point out that you're completely forgotten. You know, that's an awful thing. That, that nobody up on the earth has given you a thought. You know, most people don't realize that most people are down in hell. You know, if you go to a funeral today, no matter what the religion, they usually say, well, they've gone to a better place. But that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer, anything you can imagine. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Demons have a disgusting foul odor to them, uh, death, decay, and also the flesh, people burning. That is a disgusting odor also. And on top of that, you know, the smell of burning sulfur. Now, if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up, it's called sulfur dioxide. And if you breathe it, it will kill you. It's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone's all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. And it's, I mean, it uh, would make you vomit. And, but it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe in hell. You can't take a nice deep breath. You don't get to do that in hell. There's not enough oxygen. So maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this or a fireman. Uh, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... That was as much air as you could get. Well, it's not enough. You have the feeling of suffocation. And that's going on for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God's very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. You never get to go to sleep. Now, if you've ever stayed up for two nights like studying for a test or something, just try to stay up and don't go to sleep for two nights. You can't even function after two days. You're a wreck. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also, but you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, uh, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now that primarily means no rest from the torment but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the, you know, the sea is always moving, cannot rest. You can't rest in hell. You never get to go to sleep. So you have that feeling ongoing and it gets progressively worse every day. But see, Psalms 127, 2 uh, says, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Again, you're not his beloved. You don't get to enjoy that benefit of sleep. I was standing next to this big pit of fire. Now, I have to explain, a pit a mile across here on the earth would produce a lot of light, 
right? A filled with fire, that would produce light. But in hell, it doesn't. It is so dark, it consumes the light. It doesn't let the light escape. But I could just see through the flames and along the edges. And uh, along the edges um, were individual pits of fire, that some people were in their own individual pit. Others were in this big pit. Some were in prison cells. And along, I noticed I was standing beneath a cavern, cavern walls that were ascending up, were like a tunnel going up. And all along the cavern walls were demons, all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, and grotesque, all of them. And some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Uh, there were spiders, demons that looked like spiders, but some of them were three and four feet across. I can't give you scripture for that, but I can give you scripture for demons that look like frogs, Revelation 16, 13, and read Revelation 9. John describes a demon coming out of the bottomless pit, the most bizarre creature. Read about that. There's some really bizarre looking things in hell. Horrible. And I noticed, though, I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots crawling all over everything and everybody. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And he used the word maggot. And I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, when they consume the flesh, the maggots die. And that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not. Because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell, so the maggot feeds sweetly on thee, as Job 24.20 says. Feeds sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? See, Isaiah 14.11 says, where the maggot is spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original. It's the word maggot. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. So you can see how very different the hell that Bill Weese experienced and the hell that Megan Fox thought that she experienced. Jesus came to save us from this place. You do not have to spend eternity in torment. And we don't, we don't want to end up there. We don't want to fall away from the Lord and walk away from the Lord and end up there ourselves. And so it's important how we finish our walk. And if you have a friend or a family member that you think needs to see this video, then share it with them. Please tell them it is the most loving thing that you can do. They need to know. And we all need to know and, and encourage one another in the Lord that we're going to finish strong. That we, it doesn't matter how we started, all the sins, all the, the ways that were apart from God before. We can ask for forgiveness, we can repent, we can give our lives to Jesus and start anew. The Bible says that his mercies are new every single morning, but we are going to be committed to finishing this race well and end up in heaven one day. So God bless you all. Please let me know your thoughts. I want to know, let me know in the comments what your experiences have been. Have you had a dream? Have you had a vision? Um, what did the Lord tell you? I want to hear all of that. Um, we got to share with each other and I love you all. We'll see you in the next video.